Welcome to today's uh, University of Washington Computer Science and Engineering Colloquium. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, speaker today, Bill Tees. Uh, I have a hard time pronouncing his name, but Bill seems to work very well, so I'm going to use that. Uh, he's been at MIT throughout his entire uh, academic career, although he told me this morning he uh, was from State College, Pennsylvania before that. So there's another little university there for those of you who haven't heard about it. So uh, we're going to uh, hear about some of his interests and work today. He has interest in, in programming languages, in uh, programmable microfluidics, and in uh, uh, technology for the developing world. So it's great to have you here. Okay. Bill. Great. Thanks, David. And thanks, everyone, for uh, inviting me here today. It's really a pleasure to be here. So my goal today is to convince you that we can invent new programming language abstractions that not only enable us to utilize parallel resources, but also improve programmers' lives to motivate them to adopt those abstractions in the long term. And this is an ex exciting time to be working in this area because the whole computer industry has recently witnessed a massive change in the shift to multi-core architectures. So because single-threaded performance has finally plateaued, vendors are now investing their excess transistors in adding more cores to a chip rather than making a single core run any faster. And this has profound implications for software because if you look back over the years, really the hardware was responsible for improving the performance. Uh, you could write a single program in 1970 and pretty much just sit back and relax, kind of like you're on a honeymoon, take it easy, and you have the hardware, which is your vehicle for going faster and faster over the years. Unfortunately, looking forward, the situation is different because today's languages and tools don't let us automatically exploit the same uh, performance trends on multi-core processors. So this performance burden is now falling on the programmers, and as you can see, honeymoon is over. We all need to get out and start pushing up this performance hill. And for all of this, we're really going to need new languages and tools uh, to help us get parallel performance. So this sounds like an interesting problem. Uh, is this a new problem? Is parallel programming a new research area? Well, of course not. Uh, there have been decades of research that targets multiprocessors, everything from languages, compilers, architectures, and tools. So what's new and interesting about this today? Well, in the architecture community, they've identified a number of differences between multi-core chips and multiprocessors. Uh, for example, there are new interconnects with new communication structures. Uh, the latency to talk to your neighboring core is now on par to talk to your local memory. That's a new kind of uh, balance. There's limited memory on chip that different cores are fighting over. So these, there are some differences here, but I think all of these considerations are really kind of second order when you get to, uh, compare it to the programming problem of actually exploiting the parallelism in your programming model. So really what we're excited about being different is that we're targeting a different class of programmers looking forward with multi-core chips. Uh, previously, parallel supercomputers were really a rare and expensive beast that were limited to a few elite programmers who knew how to program them. And even today, there are less than 100 machines that have more than 2,000 processors in them. But if you extrapolate out at the current trends, you can expect in the next 10 to 15 years that there will actually be more than 100 million machines with more than 2,000 cores on board. So obviously, to utilize this power, we're going to have to make parallel programming a commonplace activity that all software developers embrace in their everyday process, including non-experts. Also, there are some interesting trends in the application space. So traditionally, parallel computing kind of focused on numerical codes, scientific applications, and simulations. And today, it's much more about the embedded space. There are already three, uh, three times as many cell phones in the world as there are computers, and that trend is continuing to grow. And if you look at the software running on your phone, it's not the same kind of software that's had the focus of the parallel computing community over the years. In particular, the software is very data-centric. Uh, for example, YouTube has been streaming 200 terabytes of data every day, 
And increasingly, we're surrounded by sensors that are inputting streams of data, photos, videos, all kinds of uh, data sources that I think the next generation of killer applications will be really in uh, kind of mining this data, understanding this data, and synthesizing new kinds of personalized trends from this data. So this is kind of where we see the application space going. And actually, uh, one thing that we've done is kind of formalized this application domain and called it the streaming domain of applications. So streaming uh, applications are any program which are based around a continuous stream of data flow. So they span audio, video, uh, digital signal processing, networking, and so on, with examples ranging from uh, video editing, things like radar tracking, cell phone base stations, uh, anything kind of uh, in the streaming space. And compared to uh, scientific programs, they have a number of attractive properties. So first, they have a very regular and static pattern of communication. So you can often describe them as a block diagram uh, at the design phase, where the components are not really changing over the course of computation. And this means the compiler can come in and do some aggressive optimizations on the structure of the program. Also, they're naturally described as independent actors or filters, which have their own local uh, address spaces and do all of their communication over the data channels, uh, which exposes a lot of the parallelism and makes it much easier to exploit uh, scalable performance. Finally, instead of churning on a big array of data, as a lot of scientific programs do, you see these streams of data having very short lifetimes, and the goal is just to efficiently understand that flow of data and operate on it in parallel. Now, what's the history of streaming computations? Well, it's also not a new idea to think about streams of data flow. Uh, there are models of computation that date back into the 1960s, things like con process networks, communicating sequential processes, and sequential, uh, synchronous data flow is the model that we adopt. And there are a number of modeling and prototyping environments that utilize these models uh, to give good benefits uh, to system designers. So for example, Ptolemy system, uh, MATLAB, and Simulink, and so on. If you look in the language and compiler space, a lot of the notions of streams show up in data flow and functional languages. So things like id and val, uh, Occam, Erlang, and ph, and so on, have a very natural description of streams that you might have learned about kind of in computer science classes. And if you go and talk to the designers of these languages, it turns out their focus was really on having the most elegant description of the program that they could. They're looking for a mathematical description of streams that's uh, aesthetic and appealing to the programmer. Often what was missing from these languages was any design that was easy for the compiler to understand. So they didn't really enable static analysis, which often prevented some of the results from the DSP community from being applied automatically in the context of general purpose programs. And that's kind of what motivated us when we were getting into this space. And we've actually proposed a new language and compiler, which we call Streamit, which is specifically engineered for stream programs. And our key leverage over previous systems is that we're designing a language that the compiler can understand. OK, so just as important as programmability is having an a language which is easy to analyze and to optimize. And we'll use that leverage uh, in pursuit of two goals. The first goal is the long-term goal. We want to expose and exploit all this parallelism in stream programs to address uh, the multi-core issues. But also, we have a more short-term goal, which is we want to improve programmer productivity, actually improve programmers' lives today to immediately address some concern that they have uh, in their development process. And we think both of these goals are really important if you want your language to actually be adopted. So if you look at the history of why languages are adopted, uh, for if you consider Java, for example, uh, today a lot of people are excited about Java because it has automatic memory management, has a lot of nice object-oriented features, it's good for instruction, and so on. Turns out the reason Java was really adopted and swept over the world was it, it was basically platform independent. You could write applets in Java and run them on different uh, machines safely inside your web browser. And it's that new capability that addressed an immediate need that let all these other capabilities kind of piggyback onto that language, and now we take them for granted. And we think a similar approach is what you need to do uh, to get parallelism to become mainstream. So what kind of progress have we made? Well, as a project, we've pursued a lot of different directions. Uh, there's been language design, parallelization, uh, how to schedule your program to fit inside different cache hierarchies, how you can extract streams from legacy code. We've done user studies and so on. And this has been a pretty big uh, academic project. Uh, if you tally up the numbers, it's about seven years, 25 people. Uh, we've written a lot of code. We actually have a public release with over 100, uh, 700 unique external downloads. And other groups have also published papers uh, building on our infrastructure.
And I've been involved since the very beginning. Uh, I've contributed to most of these uh, areas. And in this talk today, I'm just going to focus on the first three, uh, the language design, the automatic parallelization, and what we call domain-specific optimizations, which emulate the behavior of kind of a digital signal processing expert in uh, optimizing these programs. So this will also serve as an outline for my talk. And I'd like to start at the beginning with uh, language design. So my goal in this section is to highlight two general ideas that could uh, apply to other languages in the future with re respect to streaming programming languages. But first, I have to tell you kind of what our sandbox is. So let me just start with some basics. Streamit is a high-level and architecture-independent language. So that means you shouldn't have to think about the target architecture when you're writing the program. We have back-end support for uniprocessors, uh, multi-core processors, both distributed and shared memory, as well as clusters of workstations. And our basic model of computation is called synchronous data flow. And we didn't invent this. Uh, it's a well-known model of computation where you express a program as a graph of independent actors, or we call them filters. And you can think of an actor as having kind of the uh, granularity of a function in a procedural language. And the runtime system will repeatedly call this function during the execution of the program. And the key thing about synchronous data flow is that the functions declare at compile time how many items they will produce and consume on every one of their executions. So for example, uh, the decimate stage here will consume 10 items and produce one item every time it's called by the runtime system. And what this means is that the compiler can now inspect these input and output rates and statically construct a schedule of execution which guarantees deadlock freedom and can be responsible for all of the buffer management between the actors. So in this case, you would execute the first stage 10 times and the other stages once in the steady state execution. And we've also extended uh, the synchronous data flow model in a variety of ways. We allow dynamic input and output rates, support for sliding window operations, and a very neat construct called teleport messaging that I won't have time to talk about today, which lets you actually uh, have out-of-band communication between non-neighboring actors. So this is the basic setup. What are the new ideas in Streamit? Well, the first area that we uh, did something new was in our basic representation for streams. So the typical wisdom is that stream programs are a graph. And a general graph is a list of nodes and edges, which is kind of hard to reason about, both as a programmer and as a compiler. And kind of our insight and our experiment with Streamit was to say that stream programs actually have structure. So whereas this might be an unstructured graph, you might be able to refactor this into a hierarchical graph, which has much more structure. And there's an analog here with structured control flow, which was a debate that happened uh, decades ago with people arguing between the benefits of having go-to statements in your programming language and having hierarchical primitives like if-then and else statements and for loops. And there was a debate, and in the end, kind of structure won out because it really allowed programmers to focus their attention on local areas of code. You don't have to have spaghetti uh, control flow all over your uh, program. And also, compilers can recognize key idioms and start to specialize their analyses for those idioms. So the whole field of loop analysis would have been much more difficult if you always had to infer general uh, control flow out of the program. So I think there's a similar space in structured data flow, and it simplified many of our analyses. So what, can, what do we actually do for structure? Uh, well, we have a few hierarchical primitives. At the leaf nodes is what we call a filter, and this is a general purpose programmable filter uh, that the programmer specifies how to convert input items into output items. And I won't talk at all uh, during this talk about what goes inside a filter. You can just think about it as a black box. Then you can compose filters together, either using a pipeline construct, in which the output of one filter, or stream, goes into the input of the next, one after another. Or you can have a split join, in which we have a few predefined patterns of scattering data across parallel components, and then patterns of joining them back together into a single output stream. Also, there's a feedback loop for uh, introducing a cycle in the stream graph. And all of these structures are single input and single output. So you can naturally compose them together uh, into a hierarchy. And just to give you a feel for what programs look like when you adopt a structured programming model, uh, here's, for example, a radar array front end. You often see a lot of symmetry in stream programs. Here you have a lot of channels coming in and a lot of beams uh, going out. Similarly, a filter bank. Uh, this is what an FFT looks like. Matrix multiply, piece of an MP3 decoder, <coughs> sorting, FM radio with equalizer. And if we actually just simplify this graph, I can give you a feel for what the syntax looks like. It turns out that structure also makes the syntax uh, have some nice properties. And just to point out two properties, 
Here you can see there's kind of a nice co textual correspondence between the code on the left and the graph on the right. So rather than uh, a, just a list of nodes and edges, we can define this pipeline and repeatedly add stages to the pipeline by calling the add function, and it just builds up the pipeline on the right. Also, we have a split join embedded in this structure, and as we call add inside a split join, it will just successively add parallel components to the split join. Also, this structure is parameterized, so you can pass parameters in, and it'll affect the entire structure of the graph, while the compiler can actually spatially unroll that structure at compile or initialization time and resolve the producer-consumer relationships to get the best mapping to a given arc, uh, target architecture. OK, so this is kind of the uh, setup. And given this kind of syntax, we actually went and implemented uh, a lot of applications in StreamIt. So totaling about 60,000 lines of code, everything from software radio to uh, video encoders and decoders, radar trackers, mosaic imaging algorithms, and so on. And as we were implementing all these applications, we, we noticed a few patterns that we think any stream language sh should have support for in the future. And a few things that are traditionally kind of obfuscated in a traditional implementation of these programs that you really want your compiler to understand if it's going to map onto a parallel target. So let me just show you uh, one example, which is data reordering. Something that's very common when you're dealing with streams of data is you need to shuffle data to get to one actor or another. And while they often have a very simple, you know, easily understood reshuffling algorithm, that algorithm often gets lost when the programmer is expressing it in a traditional programming language. So for example, take a bit reversed ordering. This appears, for example, in many uh, FFTs. And a bit reversed ordering will take an item at index n that has a given uh, binary representation, b0 through b bk, and it'll rearrange that item to the index with the opposite binary representation, so bk through b0. So for example, here, uh, the item at index 1, 0, 0, 1, should be remapped to position 4, 1, 0, 0. OK, so simple to describe. But if you go and look in a, a textbook and ask them how you implement something like this, it ends up being far from simple. Uh, here, according to numerical recipes, we have some doubly nested loops. We have some conditionals, swap statements. Uh, we've got some shift action going on. Uh, all kinds of things that would be difficult, first of all, for a pro programmer to understand, and moreover, for a compiler to have any automatic way of understanding where the data is moving. So let me show you uh, what we did with StreamIt, was introduce a few simple primitives for splitting and joining data. And you can combine these primitives hierarchically to have a natural and also naturally comprehensible uh, expression of these kinds of algorithms. So I'll show you what we did and then come back to bit reverse. So we have a few simple uh, distribution primitives. You can split your incoming data in a duplicate fashion, which just takes every item and replicates it on the output stream. Or you can use a round robin pattern, which is parameterized by a weight n, indicating how many items you move at once. So a round robin of one would distribute one item at a time to the target streams uh, in alternation, whereas a round robin of two would join items uh, two at a time. So you pull two items from successive input streams. And again, why are we doing this uh, in the language? Well, the first benefit is that the compiler can really understand the data movement. So we've demonstrated that with these constructs, you can perform data reordering actually in an on-chip network, which gives a lot of efficiency. You can enable other domain-specific optimizations. And other groups have used this rep representation because it's very natural for describing programs. So at Berkeley, uh, Ross Bodick's group has done program sketching using this representation. And Kathy Yellick's group has automatically generated vector permutation instructions that were inferred from a composition of these primitives. So it's something that's difficult to do uh, in a traditional language. Also, it's because it's beautiful, right? And the value of beauty is not to be uh, discounted when you're talking about swaying new people to using your programming model. Uh, in fact, Don Knuth once said in his Turing Award lecture that some programs are elegant, some are exquisite, some are sparkling. My claim is that it's possible to write grand programs, noble programs, truly magnificent ones. Right, so this is what we should be aiming for if we want to lure the, you know, the real class of closet hackers into adopting your programming model. And why is this beautiful? Well, let's go back to bit reverse. Uh, whatever you think of this program on the right, hopefully we can agree that this is not a noble program uh, expressing this particular computation. Uh, if we express this in StreamIt, it turns out to be a simple uh, composition of the primitives that I showed you. And what you see on the top is a round robin distribution with a weight of one. And what that first splitter will do is send all of the even items to the left and all of the odd indices to the right. 
So we've basically split things on the lowest order bit. Okay, in the second stage, we're gonna, now we have the even items, we'll split them according to their next lowest order bit by sending uh, the zeros to the left, the ones to the right. And when you get to the middle of the split join, you've basically sorted out in the bit reversed order that you want, and all you have to do is join them together by their high order bits. So you basically read them out of the split join, first two at a time, then four at a time at the bottom, and you have a bit reversed ordering. Eh, yes, David. So uh, I'm sorry, this is a motivation question. You, you talked about 100 million uh, uh, mm. new programmers, did, uh, sorry, mm. uh, about the, the multi-core chips, mm -hmm. but you want closet programmers or you want average programmers <laughs> or you want non-programmers? Oh, okay. sure. No, you want everyone. Uh, the question is, do you want closet programmers or new programmers uh, when you're luring people to the model? I mean, I think the more aesthetic and more intuitively appealing the model is, the more likely you're, you're going to get some acceptance. I mean, it's not the only metric, but it's one metric that you can often lure people in, and especially from a pedagogical standpoint. I mean, this description on the left uh, to transition, this is how you write this in Streamit, is a very simple recursive uh, stream. In the base case, we're just adding an identity function. Hierarchically, we split with a round robin of one, add ourself with half our size, join with our current uh, high order bits. And you could al almost imagine teaching this, I mean, this is almost like Fibonacci, it's, it's, it's so simple. So I think, eh, I mean, just to have everyone understand uh, what your computation is doing. And moreover, I mean, the point that I really opened with and which is still stronger is that the compiler can understand the movement here. And you could imagine synthesizing, you know, hardware from this kind of description. You can actually have a spatial layout of this reordering rather than relying on something like a lookup table, which is what you would need if, usually in a language like C. Okay, so that's the uh, kind of data reordering. And actually, that's all I'm gonna say about the language. So now I'd like to move on and say how we parallelize this kind of description. And this is joint work uh, with Mike Gordon. So before getting into our algorithms, I'd like to emphasize that streaming is an implicitly parallel model. So we want the programmer to think about the functionality of their code and not the details of their architecture target. Okay, so there'll be a natural decomposition of the algorithm into actors and connecting them up into a program, just like you would decompose a normal program into procedures that call each other. And the compiler knows what the uh, granularity and the interconnect on your target is and will map that program into the appropriate uh, target destination. And this is in comparison to more explicit models that might require more knowledge of the target, for example, MPI, number of nodes that you have, or require parallelism annotations that are not directly semantically meaningful. So if you mark a parallel loop, it may or may not actually impact the outcome of the, that computation if you were to run it on a sequential processor. And of course, there have been a lot of other implicit parallel models over the years, uh, things like Erlang, MapReduce, uh, some ZPL from around here, uh, Occam, Sisal, and so on. And you know, these are also powerful models, but they weren't as focused on the streaming application domain. So we'll find we can play tricks where we really understand the application domain and the structure of the algorithms and the parallelism to give you much more predictable and robust performance than you can expect from most other implicit parallel programming models. Okay, so how does parallelism look in the streaming world? Well, what I want to convince you is that it's a very natural representation and kind of a canonical representation of the program for doing transformations that are very natural at the algorithm level, but correspond to very complex transformations if you were to do them in a language like C. So let's look, for example, just at task parallelism, analogous to threads uh, in a sequential model. Here, task parallelism is just independent actors on different parts of a split join that are just not connected by a producer-consumer relationship in the graph. Data parallelism, for example, running all iterations of a loop in parallel, is analogous to inspecting a filter and determining that it has no mutable state carried from one execution to the next. This is quite a simple analysis because they list their state variables in a specific place, and we can detect when their state carried uh, between iterations. If we see a stateless filter, we can actually replicate that filter into its own split join where different instances will now be operating on different input items in the original stream. So this gives us some scalable data parallelism uh, to exploit. Also, there's pipeline parallelism between producers and consumers in this graph. And traditionally, this has been exploited mostly in hardware at the instruction level. So there have been previous uh, analyses are very difficult to actually identify pipeline parallelism between whole pieces of the program. And that's something we can exploit with streaming. Now there's so much parallelism here, it almost becomes a question of what parallelism do you choose to use? And I'll just start with a baseline, which is almost the best that you could do with most automatic parallelizing compilers. And that's to just look at the fine-grained data parallelism. 
So if you look at every loop in closing the original actor execution, and if your compiler could determine that that loop could run in parallel, that would be analogous to basically having data parallelism at every one of the stages uh, in the program. So it looks like there's a lot of parallelism. How does this actually perform? Well, it turns out it doesn't perform very well. So let me show you what this graph is saying. Uh, here we're evaluating Streamit on a 16-core multi-core chip. This is the raw processor from MIT, uh, simple in-order cores with 16 memory banks. And I'm showing the speed up we get when we compile Streamit to 16 cores over Streamit running on a single core. And in most of these cases, Streamit on a single core is actually faster than the corresponding C program running on a single core. And we see, uh, even though there's a lot of parallelism, uh, there's so much communication and synchronization in this mapping that you don't get much speed up at all. The overall average speed up is around 1.3x. And so you're really overwhelmed by basically the fine granularity that you had uh, in the mapping. So how can we fix this? Well, using the streaming representation, we can go back, and it's quite simple to combine these stages as much as possible before you introduce any other serializing dependencies. So it turns out if we combine these any further, we would have removed some data parallelism from the program. And then we can go and actually replicate these, being conscious of the other parallel paths that are uh, running next to us. So if you have task parallelism by two ways, you only need data parallelism by an extra two ways to fully fill a four-core uh, target. And again, back in C, this would correspond to doing a selective loop fusion, conscious of the data dependencies, and then paralyzing the loop, conscious of other threads that are running in parallel with you, which is generally beyond the scope of any automatically paralyzing compiler. So this simple uh, kind of transformation boosts our speedups much higher. Our overall speedup is on the order of 10x now. And basically, the increased granularity just decreased uh, the, computation, or the synchronization and communication, and we get better speedups. Now, there's still some speedup on the table here. And that's in applications that don't have uh, data parallelism on all of their actors. So it turns out there's often a carried dependence between one execution of a filter and the next, in which case you can't split that filter uh, into its own split join. So what do you have to do there? Well, let's look at this uh, vocoder example. And here's uh, the nodes of vocoder annotated with their approximate computation requirements. And there are only two data parallel stages, which we can replicate into a split join, as we saw before. And the rest of the stages are basically sequential. So we can just lay them out for execution on the target architecture. This might take about 21 time units to execute. Now, the insight here is this is where we pull in the pipeline parallelism to really reorder separate parts of the whole program. So using software pipelining, we can basically prime the buffer and move some of these filters to actually execute in parallel with others from other sections of the graph. And the way to think about this is that we're starting with the whole stream graph and we're unrolling the entire execution of the stream graph. So we construct a new steady state, which represents different iterations of different filters with respect to the original loop. So filters are executing on different frames or different audio tracks. And we have a prolog, which is the schedule which primes that pump uh, to establish some buffering in the graph and let us execute uh, the filters in basically any order in the steady state. And this also lets us paralyze those stateful uh, components. So now in light blue, I'm showing the performance of uh, the coarse grain software pipelining. It does at least as good in most cases as the previous analysis uh, and gives much better speed ups in cases where the parallelism was limited by a stateful dependence in one of the actors. So uh, this, we say, has the best parallelism and the lowest synchronization. Now, what do I want you to take away from this section? Well, again, we're not extracting a necessarily uh, Office, or a necessarily obscure form of parallelism in the program. So the algorithm itself started with a lot of parallelism. But it so happens, and this is kind of, I think, the biggest tragedy of kind of uh, parallelism looking forward, that that grossly parallel algorithm was obfuscated in traditional languages like C. And so when we use something, uh, a stream language, we can naturally expose that parallelism and enable new transformations that would have been impossibly complex in a traditional programming model. So we coarsen the granularity, we data parallelize, conscious of the other task parallelism in the program, and apply software pipelining to uh, grossly reorder whole pieces of the program to actually execute in parallel. And there have also been other stream languages out there. Uh, StreamC and Brook from Stanford uh, have attacked very similar problems. And kind of the highest level differences between our projects is they started by looking at a more data parallel substrate. For example, the imagined stream processor or uh, graphics processors. And more recently, they've also looked at general purpose targets. 
And so they formalized some of these same transformations, but software pipelining they've applied mostly in the context of hiding memory latency rather than actually running stateful components in parallel uh, with stateless components. So we've kind of been sister projects uh, there. And we think these results should extend to other multi-cores. Uh, for example, we've made an effort to parameterize out uh, our algorithm, things like the local memory size, the communication to computation cost, and so on. And we have some preliminary results on the cell processor, which are quite promising uh, with the same algorithm. So that's what I wanted to say about parallelism. Now, parallelism would be great if everyone would use your parallel language. But again, we think you need uh, a carrot that will attract programmers to your language for something unrelated to parallelism, something that's a much more uh, short-term consideration. And this is where we came up with domain-specific optimizations. So this is something uh, that immediately targets kind of a painful part of the development process when you look at embedded applications uh, that do digital signal processing. And this is joint work with Andrew Lamb and Siddhaj Agrawal. So what's the problem we're trying to solve here? Well, the DSP optimization process, the goal is that you're given a specification of the algorithm at a very high level, and your goal as a systems designer is to minimize the overall computation cost. So this is independent of any architecture. You just want to rearrange the algorithm to minimize the computations needed to get the result that you're looking for. So if you look at this running example that we've had, it turns out that a lot of these nodes in this program are actually computing a linear function. So when you duplicate data, that's a linear transfer function. Uh, these high-pass and low-pass filters are linear functions, inputs to outputs, and so on. So it turns out a systems designer can go and collapse all of those coefficients into a single filter, which will do that linear function more efficiently. And they don't even stop there. Since it's doing, this is actually a convolution. It's a sliding window on the input tape. They can actually move this into the frequency domain by wrapping it with an FFT and inverse FFT and get logarithmic savings, or I mean algorithmic savings, when they're doing this uh, uh, yeah, on the target. So n squared down to n log n. And all of this right now is done by hand in a system uh, such as MATLAB. So they iteratively refine the whole global picture of the algorithm and boil it down to the essentials. And wouldn't it be nice if we could replace some of this functionality with the compiler? Now, there have been some techniques that have done this in the context of library generators. So the spiral system from CMU, uh, FFTW does a great uh, job with FFTs specifically. Atlas looks at uh, basically linear algebra codes. And what they've been missing to date has been a whole program development environment. So they focus primarily on just those uh, filters that are doing DSP transformations that are known and understood by the generator. And what we're trying to do here is integrate those same functions with very general purpose codes that are executing elsewhere in the program. So what we're trying to do is foster a migration to a unified uh, environment where you can write any program, but the compiler focuses in on the DSP parts of that program and does the proper transformation. So let me show you uh, what we focused on. Our focus has been what we call linear state space filters which is a broad class of filters that does a linear transfer function, as I showed you, but also might have some internal states that are also updated as a linear function of the inputs and the previous values of those states. So on every execution, the outputs is a linear function of the inputs and the states, and same with the update function for the states. And this spans a lot of common classes of filters, FIR, IAR filters, upsamplers, downsamplers, DCTs, and so on. Now, to make your life simpler, I'm going to eliminate the states for the next few slides. Uh, just focus on the linear transfer function. And what we do in our compiler is actually extract this algebraic kind of uh, symbolic uh, representation of a filter from the imperative code that you find inside uh, the filter's function. And this is uh, kind of what it looks like inside a streamlit filter. And without getting into the details, just want you to know that we can extract that on every execution, the first output here will be one times the input value u, and the second item pushed to the output tape will be two times this input item u. And so here we have basically a matrix that we've constructed that exactly represents this uh, linear execution of this filter. Now, what can, what can we do once we have this uh, representation? Well, we can combine adjacent filters that are communicating uh, with each other. So this is what we saw previously. Uh, if we have one filter that computes y equals du, and the next filter is computing z as a function ey. We can just uh, substitute here and see the final output z is d times e times u. And this product we can evaluate at compile time into a new matrix g to generate a combined filter. 
So again, this isn't doing a scheduling of these two filters. It's actually analogous to an algebraic simplification, which is spanning across procedure boundaries, looking at different calls basically to a library, and combining them into the minimal core. So in the best case, what could you expect from this kind of uh, transformation? Well, if you're lucky, the upstream filter looks something like this with this transformation. The downstream filter is like this. And the combined filter is collapsed to a single uh, scalar value, uh, like g equals 32. And if you evaluate this, you, in this case, you have six multiplications per output needed on the left and just one multiplication per output needed on the right. So you're actually reducing the number of floating point operations in the program. Now, I showed you the simplest possible case. Uh, it turns out we've automated the very general case, which has a lot more going on behind the scenes. For example, uh, what happens if these matrix dimensions don't match? You have two neighboring filters in the program. There's no reason they have to have matching input-output rates. So there's a matrix expansion stage that you need to simulate multiple executions of one of the filters. And this is kind of intuitive in the linear case. When you move into the state space world with internal states, you need to update the internal states in a periodic fashion and do a lot of different uh, bookkeeping, which is traditionally kind of too tedious for programmers to do in their expression of the algorithm. Similarly, the general combination rules are much more involved than I showed. In the case of pipelines, you need to consider initialization, so filling the buffer with the initial items uh, to make sure that they can execute freely in the future. Feedback loops have different periodicities uh, around the loop, which may mismatch with the original granularity of filters that you specified. And split joins, you have to handle things like implicit buffering on each line of the split join, uh, which is basically synchronized by the joiner at the bottom. And it folds into kind of internal states when you think about the split join as a whole. So we've implemented all these transformations, the very general case, and applied it across the benchmark suite. And here I'm showing the floating point operations reduction of, across these programs. So higher bars on this graph means we're removing more of the program. So there's kind of a very unusual chart to see in the compiler's world. If we hit 100% on this graph, there'd be no program left. Right? So the program would be evaluated statically. So we see in many cases we're eliminating up to 80% of the actual floating point operations. And again, this isn't an aggressive optimization which is done on hand-optimized code. This is, again, replacing a DSP engineer who would have done the same thing in anything that's actually running on your phone or any other embedded device, starting from a much more modular description of the algorithm. So we started with algorithms that were very modular. They called separate libraries. Equalizers were in their natural expression. And then running this algorithm, we collapse it back down to its minimal canonical representation and eliminate all of the overhead you would have had for that modularity that you were getting in the programming model. Yeah, Susan. Something goes wrong, mm. like radar. What is it that goes wrong? Good. So a few things can go wrong. One is that the matrix dimensions do the opposite thing of what I showed in the example. So you might have factored the computation into separate filters, uh, for example, factoring a, a DFT into an FFT, multiple separate stages. And when you collapse them back together, you end up with an n squared product. I'll come back to this and show you how we'll fix it. Yeah. Good. So we also did the, the next transformation that I described, which was the translation to the frequency domain. And here we just wrap every linear filter which we've combined down and move it into the frequency domain. And here we can, uh, again, eliminate a lot of the floating point operations in cases where we're doing well. So most applications, again, eliminate more than 80% of the flops this time around. However, you have to be careful cases like radar. We just made it a lot worse. So we're getting worse off. And again, this is actually because uh, frequency translation makes sense when you're reusing a lot of your inputs, when you have a convolution across the input tape. In the case of radar, there's not as much reuse on the input. You're actually decimating a lot of those outputs. And a lot of the benefits from going to frequency and back are lost. So it's kind of a complicated formula when it ends up being beneficial to move into one realm or the other. So what we did was actually formulate a general uh, dynamic programming algorithm, which applies every transformation symbolically to every rectangular subset of a stream graph. So this means there are a lot of overlapping subproblems. We have a lot of symmetry in our graph. We can con consider all of these transformations and build them up with an estimated cost model of how many actual flops you would be doing at runtime. And we can do this statically because we know what these uh, transfer functions are. We know what the input-output rates are, all these properties that we have about the program. And using that automatic selection algorithm, we can fix cases like this where you otherwise would have gone wrong. So let me show you the case of radar. Uh, here we're doing some beamforming. And every element in dark blue is actually linear. And the other elements are nonlinear. 
So obviously, there's a lot of linear computation in this program. And we actually checked with the original specification of this algorithm. And they said, yeah, we recognize you could actually combine these things, except it's too complicated. These are conceptually separate FIR filters that are running. And for the sake of maintenance and other purposes, we want to express them as separate filters. So that's the way they want to maintain the software, even though it's not necessarily the most efficient. So what does our automatic selection algorithm do? Well, it collapses these filters on the top into their own filters. It actually splits off the top part of the split join and collapses it down into its own filter. So it combines this into one. And it elides any transformation to the frequency domain. So this is actually our final selected transformed version of the program versus the original, which had collapsed everything possible and moved it into frequency. And now we've actually eliminated some floating point operations rather than increasing them, as we saw on the left. So we're kind of emulating the DSP expert's behavior of evaluating the situations where it makes sense to apply one transformation or another. And if we use our automatic selection algorithm, uh, we do at least as well on all the other benchmarks. And radar now turns into a win. Uh, this also translates into execution speedups. I've only previously shown the uh, algorithmic speedups. So here we see uh, approximately 4 to 5x uh, improvement on many of the benchmarks. Turns out radar doesn't improve as much on the specific target that we evaluated on, because there is uh, an issue with the data size. We're actually increasing in this case. So it is tricky. I'm only showing one part of the optimization here. But we don't make any benchmark worse uh, in this analysis. Also, there are other optimizations that we did that I don't have time to tell you about. So in the state space representation, you can eliminate redundant states. You can eliminate parameters, which is basically the number of non-zero, non-unary entries in your matrix. There's a lot of interesting math in there. And you can also translate to the compressed domain. So the idea there is that there are a lot of uh, streaming formats which are compressed in their original form. And often, you uncompress the data before you edit the, uh, the data. And then you recompress the data for a distribution. And it turns out if you're clever, you can actually map your transformation directly to operate on the compressed data and avoid uncompressing and recompressing the data for specific kinds of compression formats and specific kinds of transformations. And so we implemented that in a general way for a lossless compression format called Apple Animation Format. And we see speedups that are actually proportional to the compression factor, so 10 to 100x kind of speedups on things like uh, color adjustment and compositing two videos into one. So you'll hopefully be able to read about this uh, in the near future. So uh, before I close, I'd just like to mention some lessons that we learned in StreamIt. So I think kind of an unfortunate aspect of a lot of systems projects is that a lot of the most interesting parts are not where you succeeded, except your actual failures, right? I mean, what did you not expect? What was a surprise to you that other people should look out for in the future? And one thing in this category is kind of just the structure of uh, programs that we found. So we implemented a lot of applications, about 60,000 lines of code. And we found in practice that most of the I.O. rates between neighboring filters in a, in a graph are usually approximately matched. Uh, sometimes there's an expansion due to a frame or due to a conceptual row or column or so on. But what you don't find very often is the kind of examples that drive a lot of the literature. So this example is called CDDAT gets studied to death in publications because it has a wildly mismatching I.O. rates uh, translating from one format to another. And the compiler ne really needs to scale up the execution of each stage in order to reach a steady state. And so we were actually driven by this uh, in the beginning as well. We published some papers that fix programs like this to improve the latency and buffering requirements of their schedules. But it had very little impact on our actual application suite. Similarly, we found uh, that inside a filter, having multiple phases of execution were rarely, was rarely a win. So if you look in the literature, you'll see examples. Uh, it's called synchrostatic data flow, cyclostatic data flow, excuse me, where every filter has multiple execution steps and doing different things on different steps. Turns out, in some cases, this can reduce the latency of the program, avoid deadlock, and so on. Turns out, in our case, we built it into our infrastructure from the beginning. And it turned out it just complicated everything, uh, confused the programmers. Uh, it interacted very poorly with dynamic rates and teleport messaging, uh, which I didn't get to tell you about. And we ended up having to back it out. So it cost us a lot of time, but we don't get much credit for it. So we like you know, telling people not to do that. And another example here is that if I had to redesign the language, we find that sometimes novice programmers can accidentally introduce mutable state in their programs. So let me show you what that means. Uh, inside a filter, let's say you wanted to just generate a square wave. You wanted to push 0 and 1 alternately on your output tape. The right way to do that is just to have a single execution, which pushes 0, 
in Prochers 1. Turns out, uh, with people that aren't familiar with your language, they might do something more clever, like contain some internal state, which is the item they're going to push next. And every time they execute, they say, well, push the current item, and remember that next time I'm going to push the opposite item, 1 minus x. And this does the right thing, except it introduces state into the filter, which makes this less paralyzable. And the specific case you can detect by unrolling and looking for a period and so on, but there are more general cases that are more difficult. And so we have some thoughts on how to make it difficult and unattractive for programmers to hold state unless they have to. So what's the future of Streamit? Well, one of the misconceptions about language design research is that it's implicitly your goal to take over the world with your language. Right, and that, that wouldn't be a bad thing. I wouldn't complain if that happened, except that's really not the expectation. And really the goal is to influence the next big language. Okay, so in the world we get a new language, you know, about every decade. There was C, there was Fortran, C++, Java. These days people are moving to Python, other languages. And whatever the next big language is, I think it'll very likely be one that can leverage multi-core machines and can exploit the streaming application domain. And so a lot of these ideas uh, could translate into that language. And there's actually a historical uh, precedent for that. So if you look at the origins of C++, for example, uh, if you look back at Bjarne Straustrup's retrospective on where C++ came from, it turns out that there are a lot of other languages that influenced C++ that you might not have heard of. And a lot of these actually had an academic origin. They were done in academic research labs. So this is the kind of influence we want to have on the next big language. Where do I see my research going? Well, really, the, the common theme in my research is to make emerging computational substrates universally accessible and useful to programmers and to scientists. And today I've told you about uh, languages, compilers, and tools for multi-cores. I'm very excited about this area. I think definitely that new language uh, and compiler technology can really solve this multi-core problem, can make them useful for domains that will really uh, enable new capabilities in the future. For next inroads, I have some thoughts on other domains uh, and new dynamic analyses where we could make more traction. For example, I think you could apply a similar philosophy of abstracting obscured implementations into the language when it comes to artificial intelligence applications that often have more than one correct answer uh, when you're actually executing them, but they're implemented in a way that's so precisely specifying how you have to be imprecise that the compiler can't reverse engineer and figure out what its flexibility is. So I think if you extract those notions into the language, you could enable a lot of parallelism and also a lot of automatic uh, resource management to put different processes against each other and try to maximize some kind of overall objective function of goodness of the computation. Also, I didn't have time to tell you today, but at least half my time in grad school uh, has been spent on other projects. For example, programmable microfluidics. We've been working with researchers in mechanical engineering and, uh, and biology to develop these small plastic chips I can show you afterwards that automate all the uh, reactions that you have in a normal biology protocol. So this field is exciting because they have their own Moore's Law going. Their feature density has been doubling every five months for the past many years. And they're starting to rival the complexity of a VLSI substrate when they talk about designing these chips and programming them. So we have a new programming language for this domain. It provides a portable architecture independent description of a biology protocol. And there are a lot of neat optimizations you can consider when you start thinking about mapping programs that represent experiments rather than computations onto the underlying substrate. And be very excited, uh, plan on really pursuing this area again uh, in the future. Also, I'm ex uh, very interested in technologies for the developing world. Uh, I think this is an area where kind of the technology trends are very exciting to have a grassroots impact around the world. And I've worked on a number of projects in graduate school. Uh, the TEK project enabled an internet experience using only a low-cost email account. We're working on an audio wiki to enable rural vill villagers to publish information just using a low-cost cell phone. So basically it's like a Wikipedia, but all the content is in audio from input to output. And also with the UBOX and UPhone projects, we've been working to monitor and, and improve rural healthcare. I actually spent uh, the first part of January in India training health workers to use our devices, uh, including a cell phone to report up-to-date patient uh, status, as well as a low-cost electronic pillbox we've developed, which monitors when medication is dispensed and makes sure that patients take their pills and that health workers reach patients during the course of long-term treatments. And we're actually beginning a trial in a tuberculosis treatment program uh, starting later this year, which will run for six months uh, using these technologies. So to conclude, I think that a parallel programming model will succeed only by luring programmers, making them do less rather than doing more.
Okay, no programmer gets to work in the morning. It's like, ooh, how can I make my life harder today, right? That's not going to happen, even if you have kind of this overburdening uh, pressure of uh, parallelism coming. And we think stream programming lures programmers with beautiful programming primitives and domain-specific optimizations that immediately addresses one of their needs in this domain. And at the same time, it's implicitly parallel. So it gives you this robust performance on parallel targets via a new combination of all the types of parallelism that you see in these programs, task parallelism, data parallelism, and pipeline parallelism, with a combination that hasn't been uh, apl uh, applied previously and would be very complicated to do in languages such as C. So we think that stream programming can really play a key role in enabling this transition to multi-core processors. And I'd just like to conclude by acknowledging all of my collaborators. This has been a deeply collaborative and group project, and it's really been a pleasure working with all of these individuals. Um, so I do uh, software packet radio, mm. and in packet radio, there's a lot of things you do that don't have fixed input-output ratios. Yes. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of places where uh, you actually end up wanting to do dynamic analysis on your program, yes. because in low, in low workload environments, you want to have different blocks running than you do yes. in high yes. workload environments. Yes. Yes. So can you speak a little bit about uh, how that interacts with StreamIt and what kinds of things would need to be done to... Absolutely. So the question is, in the context of packet radio, you often see a lot of dynamic input and output rates and uh, also configurations that would benefit from runtime uh, kind of reconfiguration or analysis, optimization of the program. How would we deal with that? Uh, yeah, I think it's really important. I've talked mostly about static rates, but we do support dynamic input-output rates in the language. And the way we think about that is that you can still break your program up into basically static subgraphs where you can optimize and analyze the statically communicating pieces and basically draw a cut in the graph where you have an unknown input-output rate and limit your dynamic scheduling algorithm to cross that boundary. Uh, when it comes to the runtime analysis, really we envision in an ideal scenario, most of the transformations I've described would be done at either initialization time or at runtime inside some kind of uh, just-in-time compiler. And often you, you need knowledge of program parameters to do these things most effectively, or the, the situation on, on the current target that you're executing on. So I think actually part of the direction in our group is to, to move all of these analyses into a runtime uh, system, runtime compiler, and I think that could be really important. And I, it'll also represent new opportunities for adapting uh, to the substrate. So, yeah. Luis. Yeah, I have a good question. So a lot of the code that you showed us was uh, in always the things that I would expect to see in a library that you write once, mm -hmm. and then you don't write it multiple times. So yeah. I'd like you to comment on the, on the generality mm -hmm. of uh, string languages and why you believe that this is a... Sure, sure. So yeah, question is a lot of the code that I showed would, could have been written as part of a library, uh, as library functions, and also what, what's the generality of stream languages. So I think absolutely many of these things would be libraries. This is more of a pedagogical example of some of these things. I mean, things like FFTs, you would develop once and people would call them. You might even call out into a different language, which is, you know, implementing different versions of the filters for a given specific architecture. Really, the way we think about streaming is less what goes inside the nodes than as a method of composing software. So, and, and specifically the pipeline parallel aspect, that you want to compose producers and consumers in a way that exposes those relationships to the compiler. So I think the notion of producers and consumers is very general. Uh, I think there are a lot of domains that have a producer-consumer relationship, and really that's mostly what we relied on when we were doing most of these analyses. Uh, so if that's exposed in the programming model, the compiler can go and leverage them. In terms of generality, uh, I mean, we focused kind of on multimedia uh, audio DSP applications. We've recently seen how, how many streams can we extract from other applications as well. So we have a micro paper last year that actually ran a dynamic analysis across certain spec benchmarks and looked for regular flows of data. And it turns out there are cases there, for example, the spec parser actually parses independent sentences during its execution, but there are carried dependencies because it reconfigures the parser as well. So you can think of that as a stream program where you have sentences going through and the parser churning on them. And as long as you, you know, abstract it in the right way, a lot of these techniques apply again. So I think it's still kind of an open question. We need to push, see how far we can push. But I think the notion of streaming data flow can actually move beyond kind of streaming traditional applications. Uh, so the, the kind of optimizations you talked about, especially when you get into dynamic optimizations, optimizing for crazy different architectures, uh, creates this enormous space of, of possible implementations of your <coughs> uh, So have you thought about how, how to intelligently you know, 
choose choose implementations out of that huge space. Uh, let's see. Make sure I'm following you. You're saying if you have multiple implementations of a given actor, how would you choose? No, I'm saying that the optimizations that you talked about sure, sure. Create, create lots of different ways. Of, of oh, I see. I see. Program. Right. Right. So the question is, optimizations I talked about create lots of different ways of actually. You might have multiple different binaries that you generate depending on your knowledge of a given architecture. I think this gets back to the uh, dynamic compilation piece. I think you'll need a canonical instance of the program, which is actually input to the runtime system. And how you choose to actually do that granularity adjustment and possibly even the domain-specific optimizations would depend on the resources that you have available. So I think, again, in a production system, a lot of this would run mostly initialization time and possibly with infrequent uh, runtime adjustments depending on if your target is a moving target, if it's changing the number of cores or so on, or if your program is changing its structure as you run. So, yeah. Um, can you say a little bit about um, how you use traditional type concepts all from the toolbox and stream it, you know, polymorphic types, mm -hmm. higher order uh, functions, all that sort of thing, or do you use those? Sure. So the question is, have we leveraged uh, kind of sophisticated type systems, polymorphic types, other constructs within Streamit? Uh, we, we haven't really. Uh, we, we've been sticking with a pretty simple language at this point, which is especially emphasizes what the compiler can reason about. Often when you get into polymorphism or, or passing first class objects around, it, it creates a higher barrier for the compiler to understand the final structure of the program. Uh, at, at the same time, I think these kinds of, you know, systems could be integrated in a richer in a richer language as long as you evaluate many of those things at initialization or compile time so if you can if you treat the scripting language as something which is very rich and you still statically evaluate or evaluate once at runtime to still resolve the structure of the graph there might be a space for that but that's not really a dimension we've pushed we haven't really found a a cutting need for it what one case that is interesting is if you talk about the input and output types of filters it turns out Often you want to think of inputs and outputs as being a, sequ a linear sequence of items. And sometimes you want to think about them being an array. For example, do you, do you treat an array, like, let's say you have a frame. Do you want your filter to operate on the level of pixels, on the element of frames? And I think the place polymorphism becomes interesting is you could automatically convert between those two representations quite easily. And you might want to insert an element in your graph, which was previously operating on frames, but maybe you're adding a library call or some other element, which is on a different granularity, and you could easily see converting between those automatically. And that's something we've explored, but uh, hasn't really been published yet. <laughs>